In the last section, we installed the Arduino IDE and used it to communicate with the Things network using the monitor. Although this was a useful facility, it's only part of what the Arduino IDE can achieve. Here, we will have a closer look at the Arduino IDE, but we'll start by explaining what an Arduino is. The original Arduino was produced in 2003. It was designed as a teaching tool for students with no previous experience of electronics or programming. It's a very simple board with a series of inputs and outputs that are all presented on these headers that make connecting other devices very simple. Complete boards of electronics called hats have been designed that plug directly in on top of these headers and many may be cascaded into stacks. The main device on the board is the microcontroller, which is a very cheap device that can be programmed to continuously loop through a set of simple instructions. The Arduino is not like the Raspberry Pi that has a microprocessor that is programmable and has an operating system that communicates with the user and controls the devices around it, like screen and ethernet port. The Arduino is far less powerful. Its small programs, called sketches, have to be written on another machine, turned into commands that the Arduino understands. This is called compiling. Then the prepared compiled code is then uploaded onto the Arduino where it is run or executed. All of the details as to how to build an Arduino have been published to allow it to be copied. This is called open source and is one of the reasons why the Arduino has become so popular. Another reason is that it's simple to expand and adapt. It's called extensible. Over the years, the original Arduino has been developed into a large family of more powerful units. Learning to code with a UNO is therefore a useful skill that can build and develop with time. This course is not a programming course. It's been designed to explain how to make connections using LoRa and the Things Network. But it is inevitable that by getting things to work, you will develop programming skills. A lot of what is done in these early stages is just copying and pasting example code and modifying values to suit your particular setup. Briefly scan over code or rigorously analyze every powerful line as you wish. It's not as difficult as it may first appear to be. Let's first take a tour of the IDE to become familiar with some of the terms before using it in anger to write, compile and upload our first sketch. We have already seen the IDE in the previous section. It consists of five main areas. This large central area is the editor and is where the code is entered. These five titles head pull-downs that display further commands or even lead to further fly-out options. Some more popular commands have these keyboard shortcuts that can be used to speed up work enormously. Beneath the menu options are these five buttons. Explanations pop up as you mouse over them. They verify your sketch, upload it onto the Arduino, output a new blank sketch, call an existing sketch and finally save the current sketch. Alerts will appear in this progress bar and errors shown on the black screen below. Status information is provided along the bottom line here. And finally, the serial monitor used before can be opened by clicking on this icon here. Before we can write our first sketch, we have to prepare the IDE for our particular setup. This IDE would have fallen into disuse quickly had it not been able to keep up with the latest changes, both in hardware and software. When any new device is designed, the supplier would also produce software that allows it to be used within the IDE. As this is a bundle of facilities, it's called a library. Importing libraries is normally free and easier than it may sound. We need to import libraries from the Things Network. So, Sketch, Include Library and click on Manage Libraries. Scroll up and down to see the wide array of libraries that can be installed. We can search this list for them or more simply enter the Things Network into this field to see a compact list of what is available. Only one, it seems. Let's click on the More Info, and here are two buttons, one to select version. The Install button lights up when an option is selected, but as we can see here, version 2.5 is already installed. So, there is an Update button over here, and Update. Once successfully completed, press Close. The library has been installed and will modify what we now see in the menus. If you have a new UNO, Head over to http colon slash slash ttn.fyi slash activate and scroll down onto the map. Plug in the USB to provide power and the green LED should come on. 
Within seconds, your UNO should appear on the map, confirming that it's working and that you have a gateway in range that has received the signal and made a connection to the thing's network. If you can not see your node amongst the mass that appear, try pressing this go to my location button and you should zoom in to your device, as we did with the node earlier. Make a note of this EUI number. It's very likely that if your UNO is not new, then the sketch you require to place the baton on the world map has been overwritten and this will not function. It's also possible that you will have mislaid or forgotten the device EUI number. So this is how we recover it and the purpose of the first sketch. Just to be clear, the ability to run the map it facility just shown will disappear as soon as we upload another sketch. In the IDE, select File, Example, and the Things Network, Device Info. A new sketch opens. It's a template that we need to make some slight changes to in order to get it to function. We did say that this is not a programming course, but it does no harm to inspect the code. The editor colour codes the text and makes it easier to read, and is an aid when typing. There are always two blocks of code in every sketch, called Setup and Loop. These tragic misnaming conventions are used to conceal the fact that this section is a one-off setup for the device, and this block below it is the one that loops around continuously. We can see here in the loop a lines that are printed out with these print line statements, and followed by a delay of 10,000. That's 10,000 milliseconds, i.e. 10 seconds. Above the setup are these lines that you would be expected to review. They normally contain some helpful description and guidance. Double slash at the front of a line means it's a comment meant for human consumption and ignored by the compiler. And here it plainly says, replace the replace me in the line below with either of these two options, which you could take a guess from the numbers 868 and 915 are the radio frequencies used in Europe or the US. With this patch made, the code is now ready for upload to the UNO, but we have some final checks to do. We need to tell the IDE what board is being used and where it is connected. We have to fess up to a slight lie here. The UNO is not a UNO, it's an Arduino Leonardo. So select Tools, Board, Arduino Leonardo. We only need to do this once per session, and I will still keep calling it a UNO for brevity. The IDE now knows what board it's dealing with, but where is it connected? Click on Tools, Ports, and well, I'm lucky here, as I only have one option. That makes it a simple selection. You may have to experiment with the options if you have more than one. Should you have problems, try disconnecting the UNO and seeing which option disappears. I'm using a Windows machine here. Ports in Linux and Mac have different names. This again needs only to be selected once per session. With the board and the connection chosen, we can proceed. We can begin by checking for errors in the sketch. So click on the Verify icon. It turns orange, and the words Compiling Sketch appear here, and the progress is displayed in this bar here. It's only a simple sketch, so she'll compile quickly. The details appear in the black screen, and everything here is all white. Compilation is good. Again, a quick inspection of some of this feedback appearing here says that 21% of the program storage space has been used, and that's only running a tiny sketch like this. Now we want to upload the sketch into the UNO, so press the Upload button. The compilation phase is run again, followed by the upload, with the bar here charting the progress again. If all progress is well, no errors are displayed, and this horrible phrase, done uploading, appears. The UNO will run code automatically as soon as the upload is completed. To see what's going on, click on this serial monitor button. There are the lines printed out just as the sketch commanded. Here is the EUI we need. Job done. We will press on now, completing the connection between the Things Network and the UNO. Log into the Things Network console and on this Application Gateway page. It appears to be a little backward, but before we can register a device, we have to register an application. All will become clearer with a little use. Select Application and Add Application to see this Add Application page. Enter your choice of application ID. Once again, there are restrictions. Only use lowercase characters and avoid using punctuation and spaces. The box will turn orange as a warning if it detects any errors. This is actually quite a nice design. In the description box, any phrase is acceptable. We have already come across the Dev EUI, the device extended unique identifier that uniquely identifies the UNO. 
Here, an application EUI is being requested, another unique identifier, this time for the application. Both of these EUIs are 64 bits long, an address long enough to last well into the future. You can enter your own, but my advice will be to allow the system to allocate one for you. Note these green dots at the end of each field, confirming that everything is progressing well. Finally, the handler that deals with the application. Again, leave this as the system defined default, currently TTN Handler. Click on the green Add Application button to reveal this overview page, displaying the range of settings. This block displays the application ID and the description entered a moment ago, and a live update confirming the time of creation. The system application EUI is also displayed. Clicking on this icon copies the application EUI to your clipboard. With the application successfully generated, we can now move back to the device. There are currently zero registered devices so far, so let's add our UNO. Click on Register Device. The Register Device screen appears, and the will to live starts to drain away at the sight of this set of four entries that are all required. The style of operation by now should start to become familiar. Enter a device ID. Again, enter your choice. Only use lowercase and no punctuation or spaces. Next, enter the device EUI. This is exactly eight bytes long and is the dev EUI we discovered for the device. Again, allow the system to select an app key and the app EUI has been presented from the previous page. Now click register. The green confirmation should appear. Return to this device overview page. The overview links the device EUI and a new entry, the app key. Clicking on this small eye icon reveals the key, and clicking on this clipboard icon makes a copy in the clipboard so it can be pasted in quickly later on. Notice here so far, TTN has not seen this device. Amber, never seen. Now scroll to the base of the screen and select copy to make a copy of these two lines in your clipboard. Returning to the IDE, select file, examples, the things network, Quick start. Here's another template. At the top, the app EUI and app key. These must be overwritten with the details copied over from the Things Network page. Beneath this is the frequency plan, Replace Me, that has to be overwritten with the correct frequency for your region as before. Close the serial monitor if it's still open. Looking briefly through the code, we see the 10 second pause for the serial monitor and some reference to status and join statements. When the sketch is compiled and uploaded, the UNO will immediately begin its radio transmissions. These will be received by a local gateway and forwarded to the Things Network over the backhaul. If all is well, it should appear in the console. Pressing upload, the compilation of the sketch begins. We can see the progress and once completed, the code is uploaded. Done. Only now open the serial monitor to see what is going on. First, the UNO needs to join the network, which has succeeded, and now just loops continuously. For this demonstration, let's rearrange the screen. On the right, we have the Things Network console coming across the internet from the European handler, and on the left, the IDE, the serial monitor from the UNO, connected by USB cable on the bench next to me here. Over on the Things Network console, we can send data using this field. Entering the value 00 and pressing send, there's a pause and the received zeros appears on the UNO monitor and the LED goes off. Conversely, entering a single byte 01 on the web page and pressing send, pause again, and the confirmation that the one been received by the UNO and this LED lights. It feels like a bit of a cheat that all this is appearing on the same screen, but the ones and zeros entered into the web are transmitted over the internet to the gateway, and then via radio to the UNO. The UNO reacts and sends confirmation via radio back to the gateway, and via the backhaul again to the Things Network server, to be seen here on the screen. This will all just loop continuously. There's a good deal to be unwrapped here in this simple transmission of the one and the zero to turn the LED on and off. Returning to the console, by clicking on the application data and this clear, the packets received by the gateway and forwarded to the European handler can be seen more clearly, popping up every 10 or 12 seconds or so. 
Here is the growing list of them in real time and the counter for each packet received. If we jump back and send a 1 from the console, it's sent to the gateway and the LED changes. On the console, we can see the change of state being reflected back by the UNO. It works. Now, clicking on the pause button stops the display and allows us to have a closer look at the extra data that comes in with each of the packets. It's called metadata, data about data, as it were, and is shown in what is called JSON format, defined by all of these braces, commas, and brackets. We will look at JSON more fully later. All of the data is visible, but it may need explanation. It begins with a date and time stamp. Notice the precision possible in the seconds field. Next is the frequency of the radio signal. It turns out that gateways use any of 10 discrete frequencies in the background. They bounce around almost randomly. The modulation is LoRa. Well, this is LoRaWAN, so what would you expect? The next line, data rate, does require a little explanation as it lies at the heart of the LoRaWAN system. When the device is close to the gateway, the signal is strong, but grows weaker as the distance between them increases. At some point, communications will break down. One method of overcoming this limit would be to increase the power of the radio transmitter, but this would only drain batteries more rapidly. And we know from mobile phones how frustrating that can be. By the way, the aim of a typical theme is to run on a single AA battery for between 5 and 10 years. See now how low the power level has to be. In LoRa, the range problem is overcome by spreading the transmitted signal at half the rate for double the time, speaking more clearly, as it were, in order to get the message across. When that fails, as the distance increases further, it spreads it further, halving the rate and doubling the time again. Close to the gateway, the device operates in what is known as spreading factor 7. As the range increases, this goes to spreading factor 8, 9, all the way up to the limit, spreading factor 12, or SF12. We can see here that the SF value is 7, a good, strong, short burst, as it's nearby. Code rate never changes and is always 4 to 5 on current systems. There is a degree of duplication in the next block. GTWID is the gateway identifier. Again, this has to be unique globally. The timestamp and the time are repeated, whilst the channel number is the radio frequency mentioned before. RSSI is a received signal strength indicator. It is perhaps a little strange, as it tends to be a negative number and becomes more negative the weaker the signal becomes. More important is the other measurement of radio quality, the SNR, the signal-to-noise ratio. The range of this number tends to be smaller than the RSSI, and the only important point to note is that the system will fail when the value falls to zero. The final three values are obviously GPS details from the gateway. We've covered a good deal in this section, programming the UNO to discover its own device EUI, and then reprogramming it to receive a value from the Things Network console, control the onboard LED, and convert the value back to the console. We have also seen how the LoRa radio system copes with low power, long distance communication, providing a lot of metadata about each of the small packets. We've seen how long we expect a remote device to live on a simple small battery. The radio transmission slows down the further away these devices are. In the coming sections, we'll look more closely at what is happening and how the system deals with the problem of becoming progressively slower.